Welcome to another edition of the Will Be Blood Fight Show. I'm your host, Dave Blaine. Okay, it's a mailbag. Um, I want to answer a question that Doug Snowder has sent me a while back about how I felt and what do I think about the alphabet belts. Well, you know, really, I pretty much feel as the way, pretty much how everybody else feels about the belts. It's something that we can be rid of, something that we don't really need and care for, but it's actually something that, you know, it's not up to us as fight fans uh, to make that decision. It all boils down to the fighters themselves, you know. Unfortunately, there's a lot of fighters out there that believe having a belt strapped around their waist or carried around their shoulder give, gives them the leverage to call out for bigger fights and gives them the gives them the, the, the uh, comfort of feeling that they have accomplished something they've been working so hard for, which you can't blame them for, right? But um, the alphabet gangs has always, you know, been a major problem. You know, it's something that, it's a cancer that spreads so fast within our sport that, you know what, the host is not willing to cure it anymore. You know, it's like having a, an uncle with a bad toothache and he's old school and doesn't believe in going to the dentist. He'd rather just tolerate it for years and years and years to come where it's, you know, the pain is so overwhelming that he finally decides to go in and the operation is not as simple anymore. That's how I would describe, you know, the alphabet titles towards these fighters nowadays, you know. Um, you know, as a fight fan ourselves, what is there much really we can do? Well, we could boycott fights that have these strap belts. And uh, what that happens, though, is we take away the the meanings and the, the, actually the livelihood of a lot of these fighters that depend on us paying for these events, paying for these pay-per-views, paying for us to, you know, keep the sport alive, right? So what can we do about alphabet uh, uh, titles? There's not a whole lot. Except for keep exposing them, you know, um, the belts themselves alone, do they make any sense? No, they're probably as about as useless, useless as the judges like Dwayne Ford and Shelby Shirley that we have, you know, they're worthless, there's something that we can do without, but unfortunately, we're probably never going to be able to do without them since they've been established in the, you know, early 80s, you know, um, I don't really know what else I could really say. I mean, I could pretty much just voice my opinion, which is going to be the same echoing that most fans are going to be screaming out right now, you know, while I'm speaking, talking about how much they hate the alphabet games and how much they damage it. You know, Ring Magazine tried to establish a ring title championship, but they're humans just like we are, so they have flaws in their championship uh, policies, you know, and the flaws have been exposed and flaws have been, you know, witnessed by fight fans ourselves where, you know, we will shout and kick and scream and say, you know, uh, you're being biased or you're only doing this because Oscar De La Hoya bought the ring magazine, you know, so what is there for us to really establish except knowing as a fight fan and really advertising it ourselves as fight fans as who is the linear champion in a certain division and a certain weight, right? That's the only way we can really, you know, um, introduce who is the real champion is by Flooding in, the, flooding these websites and these YouTube sites and you know and so on and so on you know about who is the linear champion you know and that's how it really is more reckon about recognized as who is the true champion of a certain division. So ho I hopefully I answered your question, Thug Soldier. Um, if I didn't, email me and let me know, brother. You know, and um, that's pretty much how I feel about the Alphabet Game. De La Hoya, he's been talking about three trainers possibly uh, pointing out to, for him to be trained under for the Manny Pacquiao matchup in December 6th. Now, one of, their name, one of the names that have been mentioned is Nacho Bernstein, the trainer and manager of Juan Manuel Marquez. You know, uh... Bernstein has actually always been under the radar, not in Mexico really, man, in Mexico a lot of Mexicanos know of Nacho Bernstein, this is a guy that's had, you know, almost close to 14 world champions, he's had Finito, uh, uh, Ricardo Finito Lopez, he's had Chiquita Gonzalez, he's had Rafa Marquez, he's had Juan Ramal Marquez, he's had uh, Daniel Zaragoza, this is a guy that's had a long list of world title fighters under his belt while he's trained, you know, um, this is a guy that is a genius when it comes to countering and, you know, having a classic boxer puncher style, you know. Um, so really, I think the whole subject I really want to talk about is the, the right trainers for the right fighters and the wrong trainers for the wrong fighters, you know. Um, so let's start off with Oscar De La Hoya calling out, you know, Nacho Bernstein to help him out in his camp in Big Bear, right? Well, that would probably be one of the best that, uh, 
decisions that he's done in his boxing career. Oscar has always had a love and hate relationship with uh, trainers. He's never been able to really settle down in what particular trainer he wants to be under the tutelage of. You know, his last choice and pick was uh, Floyd Mayweather Sr. And it's been, on, uh, been an up and down relationship with uh, Floyd concerning money-wise, you know. Um, you know, when he had picked Floyd Mayweather, I really thought that was a really bad pick for him because the fact is, Floyd Mayweather Sr. is a great trainer in his own right. The only thing is, is that Floyd's tactics and his, uh, you know, the way he educates a, a boxer is somebody that he really, he needs to get a hold of him and where he can mold him and really script him up to what he is envisioning of what a type of fighter should be. Oscar had kind of picked him up later on in his game, so it was really hard to see any adjustments when Oscar was using Floyd Mayweather Sr., right? So picking Nacho would probably be a lot more better, more suitable for his fight style. Because there's not going to be a whole lot of changing in Oscar's style. But Nacho would probably add a little bit more of a countering. And probably really stress out the jab that Nacho really likes to see his fighters use to set up the counter shots. So... That being said there, that's the best move for Oscar Del Hoya to use. Not just for the Pac-Man uh, Pac fight, but I think for any fight that he decides to keep moving forward with. Now, Ricky Hatton has announced that he's going to use Floyd uh, Mayweather Sr. in his camp to kind of brush up his defense skills. You know, that goes the whole game. You know, the whole thing again where Floyd Mayweather Sr. is a great trainer, but this is a guy too that if you don't have the, the athleticism to use what he's giving you, then really you're not going to be able to capitalize on the knowledge that he's passing down to you, you know. Hatton should really kind of look, you know what's the ironic thing is that he should really look towards Freddie Roach. Freddie Roach, if you've ever seen his style when he was a pro fighter, he's always been a pressure, mauler type of brawler and that's been passed on to Pac-Man where Pac-Man's been able to make some really good adjustments and minor adjustments, you know, he's not a, count, a real big counter puncher, you know, he's brushed up a little bit on his boxing skills, but pressure, pressure, pressure has always been his main key and that suits a lot better for Roach, so that would suit a lot better for Hatton, not Mayweather, you know, that's the bad part about it. Um, other news was that Amir Khan has come down to L.A. to train alongside of Manny Pacquiao, and him too. He's looking at Freddie Roach, which I think is a bad mood also. I mean, what is Freddie going to be able to, to correct in Amir Khan? You know, he's not going to show him how to be defensive, and he's not going to show him how to really try to outbox any opponents or anything like that. He's going to show him how to be a pressure fighter, you know, to land his, you know, uh, uh, bigger punches and, you know, really be, uh, be able to have a better balance and a uh, better base underneath him so when he lands these hard punches and stuff. So, bad pick for him. If anything, he should really be looking at Roger Floyd Mayweather, Floyd Mayweather Sr., or even Buddy McGurk, who's had some pretty good success with fighters that are trying to revive their careers. Arturo Gatti's one of them, you know, where Arturo kind of picked McGurk later on in his career, so he saw his legs got old, and you know what, Father Time finally caught up with, uh, with Gotti with all those ring wars, and we saw the end of his career come, and I really don't think it was the fault of Buddy McGurk. So... If, if there's any trainer out there that Oscar and, and even like, you know, uh, uh, Manny Pacquiao or Hatton or even Amir Khan or any other fighter out there that's trying to either, you know, brushing up their skills or, you know, really try to up their game and stuff, the one trainer I would have to say they need to stay away from is Emmanuel Stewart. He doesn't have good success when it comes to lower weights. Remember, you know, Thomas the Hitman, he had him, he was able to mold him to what he was, you know, envisioning when he was very young, okay? Other than that, any other fighter that's been brought in, he hasn't been able to have good success. Lennox Lewis really was an intelligent fighter, heavyweight, so whoever he picked, he would have done well with regardless, okay? He had the, he, he had the, enough sense to realize he wasn't good on certain particular things, so he was able to capitalize on that. Same thing with uh, um, Wade, you know, uh, Klitschko. Another good, intelligent fighter and stuff. So, and you know, Manuel has been had had great success with much bigger men. But if you look at Andy Lee, when Andy Lee fought a contender, uh, Brian Vera, he didn't know what to do. It didn't really give him good instructions and stuff, you know. So Andy Lee was, you know, pretty much beaten up. Uh, when it came to Jermaine Taylor, same thing, you know. He didn't have very good instructions for him to keep moving forward. Um, Cintron, you know, Kermit Cintron, he gave him all the wrong advice when he faced uh, Magarito. So. That being said, you kind of see his resume when it comes to the smaller fighters. Manny would not be good for any of those other fighters that we just mentioned right now. And if you're in, in that, any of those lower weight divisions, you probably won't want to want to go with Manny. You probably want to go with Manny if you're above 6'5 and you're a big super heavyweight.
Anyways, that's uh, that's the end of uh, the Will Be Blood Fight Show. I hope you enjoyed my enjoyed my show. I'm really sorry I can only make these uh, shows so long. Uh, unfortunately, YouTube doesn't want to give me extra more minutes. Uh, I know that there's other shows that have 24 minutes long and stuff. I wish I can do that because I can. I love talking about boxing, but unfortunately, I can't.